at the state It's got me in Trying to be Mansfield's very own Trying to be Mansfield's very own Steve Malcolmus Steve Malcolmus Steve Malcolmus Star prize, the glue man. Another, this is how I shall die, incidentally, is uh, doing this, driving along at night, holding the cassette up to try and read the name of the band by the headlights of the car behind me, slap into the back of a lorry, and then people will say, he would have wanted to go this way. They'll be quite wrong. <laughs> Just tapes like this, they actually do kind of fire interest because the people who made it sound, frankly, unbalanced. So they need more of that. Most of the music I like sounds pretty unbalanced, and that's what I'm going to be looking for in Cornwall, a county about as far away from the music industry as it's possible to get, in England anyway, and therefore particularly blessed. My memories of the one summer we spent in Cornwall are of a picture postcard world of sea and sunshine and outrageous tackles from behind from my dad as we played football on the beach. But when the armies of tourists retreat, Cornwall reveals itself to be the most impoverished county in Britain. Far away from the coast and bypassed by visitors, towns like Redruth and Camborne are isolated and economically destitute. In a county which relies on six frenzied weeks of tourism a year, they have nothing. Here, there is high unemployment and few opportunities for young people. It was in Redruth that two of Cornwall's top toe tappers grew up. Richard D. James, otherwise known as Aphex Twin, and Luke Vibers. This isn't at all. I mean, I hadn't really imagined anything, but... So what's that, what's that bit there? That's where you put the decks. This is Gwenna Pitt. In 1773, John Wesley, the father of Methodism, preached here to a congregation of 30,000. Wesley was the apex twin of the 18th century. Discuss. Anti-establishment and radical, he also produced some excellent music, although it was hymns in his case, of course. Richard hasn't been back to Cornwall for five years. I love it down here. It's like so, it's so peaceful. But I know that after a while, it just that wears a bit thin, and you just get really bored and want to go and buy some records and go out and stuff. Yeah, so I can understand the wanting to buy a record. <laughs> I did work in a record shop for about three years. I was a real fan of music, and uh, just to be a bit bum-licky, I think your show definitely inspired me as well, in lots of ways. Just Pretty the different sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds all like a village around right here, actually. I think we were drove through bum-lick earlier. Well, we all used to <laughs> tape it, I think, me and all my mates. Yeah, so <laughs> even though it was illegal, of course. Yeah, of course, yeah. Tape it. We'll, we'll sort that out <laughs> later on. <laughs> How did you start doing what you do? Here, if you see what I mean. I mean, what was it that uh, was going on locally that inspired you to take up? Nothing, basically. That's what made me do music, I reckon. Just because there the was fact nothing there wasn't else. A, yeah. I mean, there is some music scene, but it's nothing that I was interested in. But it's just out of boredom, really, which is the best way to do music, I think, when you've got nothing else to do. If it was boredom that made the Aphex Twin creative, he must have been a spectacularly bored guy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Despite his maverick status within the music industry, his record sales in the UK have nearly hit the half million mark, and he's shifting units in America and Japan as well. Cornwall's musicians rarely get a hearing nationally, so the Apex Twins' success, together with the Reflex label he's set up, has inspired a new generation. If you hadn't got into music, what would you have done? Uh, well, my dad's a miner. I did a bit of work in the mines as well when I was in the, when I was about 17 or something. To get that's where I got my first money to get my first equipment, really. So it sort of helped me out for music. What was that? What was it like? It was so hot. It's really, really hot underground, and all the miners just walk around with like either pants on or just their belts and nothing else. They're just walking around in the nude, like really. Hard, Strangely primitive. <laughs> yeah, with sort of, yeah. you know, shovels and stuff. I was well spun out. Right, where are we now? This is uh, at number 44, and I was very pleased about this too. Went to town and had a shanty in the new pub in Ball Street. Bought some chips on the way back. Almost dropped them on the driveway as it was closing the gate. I read the paper for the sport, then had a shower. I'm at a loose end waiting for the rain to go. To pass my days, sometimes I listen to my CDs. I write my diary for a few years. Went to town and had a shandy in the new pub in Ball Street. I wanted to have a coffee, but I didn't say it. I never had a telephone when I was little. My parents didn't get one till I was 15. Therefore, I've never gotten used to speaking. Communication seems so distant on the phone. Got the last train back to care. Bought some chips on the way back. Almost dropped them on the driveway as I was closing the gate. I read the paper for the sport, then had a shower. I'm at a loose end waiting for the rain to go. It's past my days, sometimes I listen to the sea. I'll write me down if I'm feeling it. That's Rooney on Common Culture Records, and it's from an EP called Got Up Late, although it's subsequently cropped up on an LP. An EP which, uh, as much as anything, I was excited about because on the front of it, there's a picture of the radio which I've got by my bedside. Not the exact one, but uh, the same model that I had, uh, we've had on our bedside for I think like 25 years now. So it's much ago, easier here. It's like if you uh, wanted to set up a show or if you wanted to start a band, this is by far the easiest place that I know of where you can do that. The scene is that everyone is just like artists here and they're like making music and or doing whatever type of art, you know. The scene is just that people are creating. You don't have to like practice in your basement for six months and record a demo and then bring it to local clubs, which is the case in a lot of towns. You can uh, play in a band that's only practiced twice. <laughs> that your weird friends are having a house show and people will think it's great. I've known Honey, uh, who helped start Red Summer for a long time. I think we supported each other. She supported me doing art and stuff definitely by giving me a space to do art. And um, we've played music together a little bit. The store is like a, I think it's, a, it's just a collective of ladies that uh, all uh, were buying and selling vintage and used clothing. And um, some of their friends also selling records here, so it's sort of a sort of them working all together, selling their wares. I got started playing music for a grouper. Just uh, I had Wurlitzer keyboards for years and a four track, and I just I don't know. I just finally figured out how to use them. Doing a song live is pretty different than doing it on a recording. I have been using tape collage in order to get some of the different layers live. And also, I use a loop pedal for vocals live, uh, which I don't do with recording usually. Other times I'm thinking of doing music or 
like times where I would feel down or something. That's probably coming from me as a person. <laughs> or from where the impulse to make music is coming from. This place, the community of music here, Marriage Records is totally a function of that. It couldn't exist in another place without the venues here, the community here, um, and the attitude toward music, which is very, like, very street level. Marriage, well, it's in the name. It's a community before it's a business. As a kind of a blueprint for creating a label that's around a community or a group of friends, first and foremost, before it's around like hip, what's hyped right now, what's, you know, let's catch this band as they're blowing up so we can make some money and stay cool. And it's not like a cool, cool search. Mm. I'm from LA where everybody, you know, is a rapper or an actress or something like that. So to come here, just 1500 miles away, was like, this is big. Now, now I'm into whole other genres of music that I probably wouldn't have been into and I really think a lot of it is because of, of my surroundings. You know, if I lived in a more concentrated hip-hop area, yeah, maybe I would have never broken out of that, you know what I mean? Right. Like I do a project with Chris Funk from the Decemberists. We got a group called Knock Knock, Knock, Knock. where it's all like this kind of indie rock, hip-hop, yes, collabo sir. stuff. I mean, we did stuff with Shara from My Brightest Diamond. We did, we worked with Feist, you know, like who would have ever thought that I would have done something with Feist, you know what I mean? <laughs> The idea of new towns in Britain is in fact an old one. In the 13th century, King Edward I was looking for growth points. In 1515, 
Sir Thomas More in his Utopia described 54 new towns, which would have been a planner's paradise had they come to be. seien sie unterwegs zum nächsten Coup. Tower Hill in Kirby ist ihr Revier. Das Hauptquartier haben sie in den Hochhausruinen aufgeschlagen, dort, wo früher ein paar tausend Menschen lebten. Für etwas Geld würden sie gern einige Scheiben einwerfen, bieten sie an oder irgendwo ein Feuerchen legen, am liebsten aber ein Auto knacken weil das doch gute Bilder gibt. Ruf verpflichtet. Vandalismus als Räuber- und Gendarm-Variante. Ihre Zeit verbringen sie hier auf der Straße, weil es sonst für sie nichts gibt. In die Schule gehen sie sowieso nur selten. Irgendwann ein Vater, der seinen Sprössling sucht und böse wird. Really, high tech is the aesthetic crest of a new wave of indie underground music fans whose culture is almost entirely based online. These are people in their late teens, early 20s. This music is um, uh, uploaded onto, no, is networked on Facebook and uploaded onto um, Bandcamp and SoundCloud. Record labels um, still provide an aesthetic and communal focus for this, these scenes, um, but often the people who run them and the artists on them haven't even met each other. Um, this new generation doesn't even have the beginning, uh, beginnings of a nostalgia for analog indie or, or any belief in its inherent authenticity. They even congregate around live streaming gigs, most famously SPF 420, um, a um, a, 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 a tiny chat streaming platform which uh, used to host Vaporwave events and now has hundreds and hundreds of fans who rock up, really, really like it and don't seem to have too many people writing about their scene. So let's return again to these three terms at the start of the talk. Um, high tech is a new mode of production for the self-releasing underground and it is situated in the very same digital world it engages with aesthetically 
and critically. High tech is a new countercultural position, a form of resistance to the power of the indie aesthetic itself, as well as a form of critique or engagement with capitalist musics. I described it once as lo fi going on the offensive rather than. Dis um, uh, generating the other of, of, of corporate music. It's becoming that and uh, reclaiming that. And high tech is the aesthetic that embodies this position. You might say that it's a replacement of the indie aesthetic, but I would say that it is the indie aesthetic itself, or what it should be in 2014. It is the new confluence of countercultural ideology, novelty, and technological necessity. Thank you very much. So we're at 1210 First Street in uh, Aberdeen. This neighborhood used to be called Felony Flats, and um, it's basically right in downtown Aberdeen. This is one of the houses where Kurt Cobain grew up. He actually spent more time here at this house than in any other one, and it's currently up for sale. I'm going to go in and take a little look here. You see there's a newspaper box for the newspaper, The Daily World. Come in here. This is a uh, four-bedroom house that's on the market for, I believe, about $500,000. And obviously, most of that is the historical value of Kurt Cobain. I'm a name. The village I come from is near Abbasoch. I was brought up on Bauhaus and black bedroom walls. And I had my first snake bite when I was in halls. At my gig up in Butlins, the red coats complained. They tried to remove me, the bottles they rained. But for the first time in history, I didn't run and hide. And the scousers in Shell suits had got some their side. Now this land of my fathers, it don't suit my needs. I'd rather be some place like Bradford or Lee. Where the Gipton teenagers could meet in my shed for advice on mascara and all things undead. Now my left index finger. Hovering over a world that's gone wrong. Ask me to press that in, and that's what I'll do. And we'll all die together, and Dylan. So I'm um, not sure who will buy this place, but there, is, there are a couple of entrepreneurs in Portland who are talking about buying it and turning it into a, uh, into a museum. So we'll see whether that comes to pass.